and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Laura Shackroford from Fideri.ai. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Laura Shackelford, the CEO of Fideri.ai, and normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Laura, hello and welcome. Thank you. So good to be here, Shannon. Oh, I'm so excited to get to hear more of your story. We recently met through LinkedIn. It was mm -hmm. Awesome. I love when people reach out to connect and uh, and have had some great conversation already. So so tell me, okay, so you're the CEO of Fideri.ai. So tell me what type of business is Fideri.ai? Fideri.ai is an AI strategy firm. We focus on helping we, we um, for organizations drive their AI first strategy. So moving from anywhere from where they're just starting to experience uh, experiment with AI, they could be further along in the in the progression, and maybe they're an AI adoptive or even an AI integrative organization. But we help them get to where they're AI first, and they're able to use AI to both explore and exploit. Um, the exploit is let's drive efficiency with the parts of our business that we're focused on today. And then when we create efficiency, we've got space and time and insight, more insights from data to be able to look and see where there are other um, opportunities that we can explore and, um, and drive you know, into new markets, new segments, all those great things. Well, with the uh, the boom of generative AI hitting mainstream media, that's got to be a lot of companies looking to hit the panic button and and decide to start implementing an AI strategy. It is it is so fun. It is um, you know I I I compare it to a bag of popcorn. It the last uh, I started this in January and it was building blocks right. And there's still some blocks that are being built because it's new and we're small and running fast. But um, it was all of a sudden, it just felt like all those kernels were just right there. And you were just like the last ones were coming and we popped the bag open. And now we are, it, it is it is so good. Um, organizations are you know, making the move to, their, to AI. They are realizing they have to have their AI strategy. And many times they don't even know exactly why or what they need. They just know that they're going to be left behind if they don't have one in place. And it's just the grand swell is there. So that's an exciting time. Oh, very exciting time. And I love that visualization of popcorn popping. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's so perfect. <laughs> that just explains it very well. Um, <laughs> so so as the CEO, so what do you do for, for your company? So what I do for the company as CEO is, you know, when you're a small company, you're doing everything. So uh, about 10 minutes ago, I was on the phone with one of my business partners who I worked with at Oracle 20 years ago, and we were revising the sales deck. About an hour ago, I was on the phone with one of my other business partners who I recently met from doing my master's degree at Oxford. He's one of my classmates. And we were fixing the website, which um, is still being fixed, by the way. So it's um, I think it's all that in a day's work. And before that, I was um, working with a client where we were going through a statement of work and putting the finishing touches on which of three options they're going to take to move into that, you know, progression from an AI adoptive company to moving from to AI first. So it really varies. But the fun thing about being a small organization and new is that I get to have my hands in everything. 
Uh, I love it. So, and and you've kind of touched on and hinted at that you're a co-founder of the company, um, but I want to get into that. I want to come back to that in a little bit here. So before we get into that, so tell me, Laura, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Did you think to yourself at six years old, like, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a co-founder of this AI strategy company? What was the dream? <laughs> I've never told this story on a podcast ever or any in a talk nowhere. I yeah. wanted to be CEO. I did want to be CEO and founder of a fashion design company and retail store. And my flagship store, I grew up in Missouri in Kansas City. So my flagship store was going to be in Lake of the Ozarks. <laughs> um, back then they had this little shopping area and I thought that was just going to be the greatest thing. Um, obviously, eventually I realized I wanted it to be on, I don't know, Madison Avenue or somewhere in somewhere um, higher end. But um, that was the dream. I didn't know I'd end up being CEO of an AI strategy company instead, but it's uh, it's working out. And I can tell you more about my path if that's where we're going. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. <laughs> uh, that was uh, initially my when I was six, probably I wanted to be either Wonder Woman or Ella Fitzgerald. Um, wow. <laughs> I, would I would take either of those or both in one. Both, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but my first business plan that I wrote when I was 12 was for a retail store, was a fashion oh, wow. retail store. Yeah. Cause I grew up in Nordstrom stockrooms and, um, so Nordstrom was, was my model there. <laughs> How neat. Well, maybe yeah. you and I will start a business on the side. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so funny. So I can, I can totally really, I love that dream. So, so tell me, so then as you, but as you got older, you know, what did you um, study in? What did your interests go to towards? And so how did you progress into your career and your first job? Sure. So I, I, I did follow my dream and I majored in fashion design and I got a job um, when I interned with Nicole Miller at the time, Nicole Miller, she's still wow. around and I yeah. think she's amazing. Um, yeah. she was just, you know, a, a, for a what young woman who grew up in Kansas city, Missouri to go spend a summer at, I was one of her six people in her design team and to get to go, she, I got to be on lifestyles of the rich and famous. I also don't tell that story. Um, but she was featured and she, you know, put me on as though I was shopping in one of her stores. There were, and it was, it was more than that. I got to go back and produce, help produce. I was very minor in the whole scheme of things, but I got to help on her fashion show that fall. It was wow. the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, and I loved it. And I just, I went and graduated from college and she had offered me a job and I was all excited. And I hit this moment of panic and, you know, the whole, I don't know if it was the imposter syndrome, but in this case, in 19, 93 to be a great fashion designer you had to be a great great at drawing and i wasn't good at drawing i was really great at ideas and i was a hard worker so that's how i got my in but even nicole when she interviewed me for my internship she said i'll hire you if you never make me look at one of your drawings again <laughs> so my panic was yeah. oh god what if I, what if I end up doing this job for 30 years and I never make more than $17 an hour because I can't draw. And, um, and at the time I re read about Levi Strauss having this aspiration statement. And I thought, well, there's a place I, I know I can succeed in corporate. And I thought I can go to Levi's, I can get into design and I can also be a corporate person so that I can use those skills and not have to, you know, compensate for the fact that I cannot draw. And so that's what I did. And it's another podcast to tell you how I worked my way into Levi's. That it's a funny story, but for another time. Um, but uh, that led me to the Bay Area, working for Levi's at their headquarters there. Which, of course, once you move to the Bay Area, you have to find your way into tech. It just happens. Um, yeah. I ended up answering phones for Oracle, which was the best way in the world to learn the tech industry. Um, and from there, wound my way into business development roles and marketing. Um, and I wanted to lead a marketing organization. So I kept going, you know, I checked off the box and now I led product marketing. Now I led demand gen and I went and did every function. And at some point I became a CMO and I thought, okay, now I want to be a CEO. And that was 2012. And it took me um, uh, that long to get the guts, you know, and the courage to go and 
do what I'm doing. And then when AI popped to a year, what was it, 2020, anyway, 2022, when Gen AI, I should say, um, became more mainstream and available to everyone, I thought if I don't take this opportunity, I'll never do it. So here we are. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, I, it's such a it's such a journey, and this is why I wanted to start this podcast because there's no linear line into data and into that into this space and into any tech space. Um, and you and I did not uh, diverse too much from uh, in that in our paths. That's hysterical, right? Uh, when I got into tech, I started on the phones at Microsoft. I didn't know what a browser oh was at the time. That's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I love. Yeah. So, okay. So, so tell me though. So you decided to found um, this company. Um, so tell me about, uh, you know, working with the founders and, and uh, so you say you have two, uh, two founders, co-founders um, or, or business partners or, or how is that, how did you start taking that big leap? Yeah. You know, I was, I was at Intel and I, I just felt like, like I said, when I saw everything happening in AI, I thought I, the part of my career I've loved the most has been the data aspect of my career. When even back at Oracle, um, when I was answering phones for Oracle, I was the partner network and people were calling and buying development licenses to build um, internet applications on our database, if you can imagine. Yeah. And I became the dot-com person. Um, so I got to go and round to Bay Area companies and meet people in their dot-coms and figure out how to license databases so that they were, uh, we called them runtime at the time back then, so that multiple people, you know, you didn't license a database to a party of one. And most people don't even know what I mean by that, but it was a completely different world. Um, and I just, there's something about the data side of it. I just think, cause it's, it was my formative time. You know, I always loved my roots at Oracle. I spent eight years there. Um, they were eight of the toughest years of my career because it was, it's a tough place and eight of the best. Um, so yeah, I just, um, data has just been in my DNA for such a long time. And I wanted to, uh, I, I and I progressively throughout my career, I worked at SPSS where we helped found, create the predictive analytics category, particularly mainly when IBM bought us and the whole world suddenly knew about predictive analytics. Um, when I, you know, the, the whole big data and Hadoop era I was a part of. And I really had this itch when I was at Intel to get back to it. And that's where so many of my friends' friendships are with the analyst and, you know, press. And I can't believe we haven't crossed paths until now, but now you. Um, and it's just, it's just such a great world. And so I started Fideri and thought, I thought I would focus solely on the data um, piece of it and helping to market the data piece within AI. And, you know, it's just like any startup things evolve. And over the course of the last, you know, nine, nine months ago, it was an idea. Five months ago, it became real. And during that time, it really evolved from, okay, marketing for data companies who were helping it with people with AI to what it is today, this helping people in their AI journey. One of the really beautiful things about it is it took me back to my roots. I ended up reconnecting through this process with my honestly favorite mentor manager, sorry for the others who are listening, but my favorite manager and mentor ever, um, who was this guy, um, Jeb Destiel at Oracle. And he had just retired from Oracle a few years prior and suddenly had a little bit of time to become one of my advisors. And so he's a, both an advisor and he'll go out and do some client work for me a little bit. You know, he's mostly retired, but he's been so helpful and instrumental. And um, one of his direct reports at Oracle for years, I worked with 20 years ago, he's come along. He's now one of my co-founders. And then, like I said, I started this Oxford program in March and it's funny, the guy, they, they gave us assigned seating our first week on campus. And, um, I was in the front seat in the front row and I was terrified because I thought they're going to see me if I fall asleep. That was my issue. And, um, and so I kept just, you know, caffeinated and I would make sure to check in with the guy next to me, you know, to make sure I stayed awake. And anyway, that guy now is, uh, Vikas, he's one of our, my co-founders. And so you just never know where your path leads you, but it's this beautiful mix of, people I've had a relationship with 20 plus years and 
um, and people that I've just met, but we're in this really close working space of this program where, you know, you have to read eight books in two weeks and you're all kind of sink and swim together. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Um, and so it was, it was kind of more, uh, uh, circumstantial that it, it all or, came yeah. together. Very yeah. organic. I didn't yeah. expect, I didn't expect this at all. I thought it would be me and one other person an analyst and we're, we're, uh, it went a completely different direction and it's wonderful. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Oh, I love that you're open to to the evolution. Uh, it's so. Tell me. Um, how do you how do you personally work with data in your typical work week and your role as CEO and uh, founder of this amazing company? Mm -hmm. A couple of things. One is it's it's great. I just got off the phone with someone who is a a lead partner for IBM Business Consulting in one of their industry practices, and we were talking about how their his industry is working with AI. Um, this person is focused on defense. And we went through all these examples and it was beautiful though, because at the end of it, he kept coming back to, but it's all about the data. And, uh, and that is, you know, like I mentioned, that's a, such a big part of my art and soul. I started in that world and, um, and it really is you to do anything it's in AI, you, you require the data. Um, you need to know what your data is. It needs to be in the right shape. You need to care for your data. You have to have data governance and ethics, which is dear to my heart. Um, and so I get to look at, for instance, if I want to, I've got a company I was talking to this morning and we identified a uh, recruitment at their consulting firm. And so we said, Hey, we should probably help you with recruiting consultants. And as one of the primary use cases and here, are a couple that we could look at, well, to do, to do those use cases for them, we have to have their, you know, their IP is this database of, of consultants. And we have to be able to have access to that database. It's got to be in the right shape. We have to access it and do the right things with it in these use cases to make it useful for them. So it is literally at the heart of everything we do. And, um, and I, I think I'm thankful for the experience that I've had with it because it kind of more intuitively gives me that ability to go, you know, this, we've got to take a look at this. Um, we need to dig deeper. I am, I am not the world's data expert by the way. And I know that, so I will, I know how to bring in the right people. Um, and like I said, it's a, it's a world where I have these great relationships so I can go and tap. Okay. I know this guy is the guy when I need help for, from a legal perspective with da data governance. Um, this is the guy that I'll go to that I think is the best in the world at that one slice of it. And so that's where data, it, it's just immersed in absolutely everything. Sure is. Oh, that's that's amazing use of it. Um, and so, you know, having been immersed in it in uh, a while now, so um, what is your definition of data? I was considering this before we had this conversation and I, <laughs> I did not come up with a good answer. I mean, my gut reaction, what I wanted to say was data is the most precious resource of any company. It is the, it is the goal. I, you know, I'm not going to say data is the new oil. I actually hope people will stop saying that because it's not, it's, it's uranium. It can be used for a great good and it can just, you're kind of, you're hurting it and do bad things with it. Um, but data, I do believe is the lifeblood of any company. Um, I, and I also think it's the future of, um, any company when you, when you look at how you might apply, something in your business and we might move into this new market. Um, yesterday I was talking to a CEO about, and he started his own AI startup and they focus on education. They have this great AI platform that you can apply to many things to educate people and also to create digital twins, which is a, another beautiful part of their product. Um, but with their product and the, the way that they use data, the data is important and essential to be able to power that application and even allow it to do anything. Um, but one of the really cool parts of it is at the end, he said, and what's really great is after you use the application for a while, this, this educational tool that they've built, 
then you're going to have all this additional data and it's going to give you all these insights and you'll be able to know so much more about your customers and move into new markets. And that's the thing with data is there's always more to understand and explore. And it, it's always there to, to help you open new doors if you're open and you're treating it um, as the asset or future asset that it can be. It's very, very true. And it's so funny too. I know many people who hate the phrase data is the new oil. And I, <laughs> and I have, this is the first time though that I've heard it compared to uranium. And, but I do like that analogy as well. You know, uh, just the, cause you're right. It can be used for good or, or bad. It, you know, you, everybody thinks that data is just pure facts and there's no debating the data. But if you put data in context, um, and you build the context to manipulate or make the data look like it's something other than it's not, then it, it definitely can be used inappropriately. And I'll give you another quick example. One of my classmates, yeah. we were in a, a session and it was a session about data. And the professor said, all right, we just had this conversation the last few hours. And I just want a moment of truth. Everyone in here who's a data hoarder, raise your hand. And I thought, no one's going to raise their hand. No one is a data hoarder here. And uh, several people did. And one of them was this woman who I've built this friendship with. And I have such deep respect for. And my jaw was on the floor because I thought, no way, are you hoarding your data? And she might listen to this and um, and uh, and poke me later. But uh, I don't know. That might not be the right term. But anyway, um, she, uh, <laughs> she said, well, I'm in this unique organization where I can't even, it's very private and confidential, but in our organization, we are always trying to figure out new markets and help people new, move into new businesses. And I don't know what the application of my data might be in five years. It might be something that is completely unknown to me where the data that I threw away, you know, a year ago is something that I could have used in the future. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, she ended up saying, okay, you know what, I've got to let go of some of the data because Again, it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And, you know, we want to stay on the on the good side of that. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> um, can relate. I, I, I have a tendency to keep as hoard things. <laughs> I need to force myself to cleanse and purge. <laughs> I've been accused of that once and once or twice. <laughs> that's why it takes me so long to unpack a new house. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, so tell me, you know, so you talk a lot about mentors and, and, um, that you've, and people you've met along the way, but what's your, been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Biggest lesson by far is values. I, I mentioned that I joined Levi Strauss many years ago because of their aspiration statement. At the time, they were the only company that I, I still, that I know of that published their values and said, this is how we're going to operate. This is how we're going to live. We are inclusive. We are going to embrace diversity. We are going to hold leaders accountable. It, there were, it was, it's so beautiful. I, I wrote an article about it and the statement's still out there somewhere, but I grew up with these Midwestern values. I got to embrace them when I went to Levi's. I carried them with me. And when I went, had those beautiful eight years at Oracle, I held so strongly to them because it, they got tested constantly. And throughout my career, they have continued to be tested because that will happen. It's it's um, it's the world we live in. And uh, I think there are a few exceptions where I didn't stay true to my values. I didn't mean to. It was maybe youth and lack of confidence. And I I both of those times I looked back and said never again. And I've I've held true to my values, and it is it has cost me. You know there times where it's cost me relationships or it's cost me, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of something, um, where I don't think the values are honoring other people, but I, I will always hold true to my values. And, um, for me, I think you got to be able to put your head down on a pill at night and look yourself in the mirror, all those things. So I think that's the most important of anything is integrity to yourself. I couldn't agree more. Didn't know did you, are, did your values are, were they something that you grew up with that you developed? Have they changed over time? It's funny. I, I was lucky enough to grow up in a, a family where, a, um, you know, conservative Kansas city, Missouri. And we, we belonged to this church that we went to every Sunday. And it was the first church in, I believe in the Baptist world that embraced, um, gay 
relationships. And I just grew up in this world that was inclusive and open and loving. And, and so, but, and it was also filled with honor your word, um, you know, be, and have integrity with your word and do what you're say you're going to do all of those things. And so I, 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 that was deeply ingrained in me, but just life experience teaches you, I think more and more as you get older, especially that we are all the some parts of the way that we treat people. And, um, and I, I just, I know that I know how I want to be treated. And so much of that drove how I, how I decided to treat others. And I've not always been perfect. You know, there were times, there were a few years where I was a terrible manager. I was trying to be good, but I, I didn't know yet, you know, you learn yeah, and sure. but it, yeah, as you make mistakes, you learn and grow yeah. and, yeah. and you do that by holding true to those values. Oh, that's very, very nice. Um, yeah, it's, and very important. I, I think that, yes, so many people waffle because they feel the pressure or peer pressure or corporate pressure to, um, do something that they don't feel good about doing, but Indeed. yeah. 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 But you're right. You know, we have to wake up in the morning and face ourselves and be able to be, and, you know, happy if you put a focus on happy and, and, and being proud of what you're doing, you know, and who you are, then, then that's becomes very, very important. Um, and it makes the world and you a little bit better, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I'll add, I mean, part of the reason I wanted to found Fideri, a big part of it was I thought, I want to be able to create an organization where my values are at the heart of it. And I know, you know, the actions we take are going to be honoring of, of treating each other with dignity and respect and, and inclusion. So um, that's a really fun part of getting to create my own company and culture. Very, very cool. So, you know, as you, you know, especially as you're creating your own company and, and as you're looking into this and, and working with other clients, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data uh, increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? I I wish that I knew and that I, I, I had data that could tell me where this is going to go. And I thought a lot about this because I think that there's just going to be more opportunity Mm -hmm. On, in some ways, may, there are many AI tools out there that make it easier to work with data than ever. Um, I, not being a deeply technical person, I can do a lot now on my own that I couldn't do a few years ago, like um, scrape a website and vectorize it and go put a, a front UX on it and make a chat GPT-like experience for someone. I would have never dreamed I could do that for, for someone else on my own in a few hours. Um, so in some ways like that, things like that, you know, we don't need as much of the experts. On the other hand, data governance and data ethics, they're so much more important. The ways that we use data in the future, um, even the conversation I had earlier today about uh, AI in the defense industry and the fact that in defense, there's always a point where there's a human because it, at some point in the defense industry, there are lethal de decisions being made that have lethal consequences. And you know, and even in that, I think you're going to need data experts figuring out the nuances of that more than you ever have. So, and I just feel like with more exploding AI use cases, that there will be just that much more need for data management and more specialization. And I hope that's the way that it plays out. I, I think you're right. Uh, I definitely think see it growing. Um initially anyway, to support all of the initiatives um, that, like you say, data governance and, uh, and ethics so are so important. And as so many companies try and stand up AI, they realize that they need to set up a whole data management strategy to, uh, first. <laughs> yes. And that <laughs> is know where the data is coming from. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It is yeah. part of our offering because we couldn't, we couldn't do a good job by people without being able to help them with their data. Um, and to your point, when you said, at least initially, yeah, who knows what the future holds. And there are of course, right. all these assumptions that jobs are going to go away so fast, especially jobs like ours and who knows, but I think at least for the near term, people need AI strategies and people need data leaders, data experts. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give then to people looking to get into a career in data? I think get your hands on it. And I, as, as 
even it's not funny. My first job at Levi's didn't end up being in design because my path in was for being a an analyst. I analyzed sales and marketing and for the uh, J.C. Penney and then Sears accounts in the Chicago region or the Midwest, I should say. But the data, I never thought of myself as a data person coming from fashion design, but it was all data. And the only way that I figured it out was I would just sit on weekends and I would look at the spreadsheets and back then it was green sheets and I'm not embarrassed of that. I'm proud of it. Um, that I would look at it and you just, the only way through it is getting to know it and mm -hmm. figuring out how you apply it. Um, there are so many great organizations and there's training, like uh, there's a lot like what you all do at Dataversity, but people just, you know, get in it. I don't think there's, there's not that clear path of, oh, I went and got my degree in data management today. Um, maybe there is something that I'm not aware of, but I, I don't think it's as clear as, okay, I went and got my degree in um, computer science or engineering, things like that. And there are just so many paths though, that are open to people. And one of the other great things is we don't need degrees the way that we used to. You know, I mean, there's great opportunity for people who, for whatever reason, don't choose to go to university and can take a lot of training that's available to them today. So my 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 hope is people just, you know, you have your idea, you think that you want to get into it, just dig in and get started. Really good advice. Oh, Laura, this has been such a pleasure to get to know you. I can't believe how many similarities we have. <laughs> I know. And I felt a little, I'll tell you, I felt a little vain, Shannon, because I'm sitting here talking about, I founded this company and I wanted to do this and build a culture and look what you have grown with Dataversity over the last, I believe it was a little over a decade, if I have that right. Um, <laughs> but yes, we have similarities. I hope to be able to create the success and impact that you've been able to make on uh, in this world. Oh, I certainly haven't done it by myself. Our, our founder, <laughs> Tony Shaw, has been, you know, the he, he talk about, you know, a great mentor. You know, he I have the dream job, really, because he lets me build this company and 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 run with my ideas and while well, he funds it all, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's so good and he's such a good mentor. He's been in the conference business for 30 years and is so attentive to detail. So but yeah. Yeah, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, it's been fun and and it's hard work. Like you say, we wear many hats and do a lot of things, mm -hmm. but it's so much fun. So rewarding. Um, it is. It really, really is. So, and now I get to do th fun things like this podcast. And <laughs> right. we're getting back to the real work of spreadsheets and. <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong. I love that too. Yes. You good know. point. Yes. yes. One of the, uh, uh, in fact, one of our uh, uh, staff bought me a mug that says, Ooh, this calls for a spreadsheet. Oh, <laughs> nice. I love it. <laughs> Cause I do get excited about them. Oh, a pivot table. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Let me pivot that. <laughs> 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 oh, it's such a pleasure. So, um, so Fideri.ai, I assume that's the URL. That's right. I love yeah. it. You can so, find and, us there. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere, anywhere else in uh, uh, LinkedIn account? The team and I, yeah, we've got a LinkedIn page. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. It's funny how much, how essential that's become to all of our businesses. So mm -hmm. uh, message me there. Um, love to connect with people the way we were able to connect Shannon. And, um, you know, you just, you never know that the, the connection points that you have with people and where we end up crossing paths along the way. So true. Uh, well, thank you so much. And we'll get all those links posted to the podcast page as well. So everyone can find you and solicit your services as they build their AI strategy. Thank you, so, Shannon. Uh, thank pleasure. you. <laughs> it's been so much fun um to all of our listeners out there if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe until next time stay curious everyone Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.